Um, this one is, I've never seen an image like this, but the, the, the iconography and the concept is a little more conventional. Um, the idea that the soul must journey to God. Life is a kind of pilgrimage uh, where you're traveling uh, to God. And the personification of the figure here is the soul. And the soul, as you can see, is threatened by devils. We're going to shoot arrows at her. I think it is a female figure. But, um, and, uh, well, that would make sense. Once again, the soul would be a feminine noun. Um, and also, if this is particularly uh, in the context of the nuns in the convent. Um, the feminine souls. Uh, at any rate, uh, the devils, uh, who are these little uh, grotesque figures, uh, are threatening the soul, and the soul looks to the hand of God for strength. And of course, the hand of God reaching down for heaven uh, has, since early Christian times, been an emblem of God and God the Father. We've seen the Mass and the crucifixion in the Uda Gospels, and here they're put together in one image. Uh, the crucifixion on the top uh, with these golden rays uh, that lead right down to the altar uh, of the Mass. And so at the top uh, we see the suffering Christ on the cross with the church, who is the bride of Christ, collecting the blood in the chalice. And then we see down below the altar, and the church is down there, uh, sort of kneeling at the altar and looking up at the crucified Christ. So we see the church twice. Uh, remember that in the Mass, the bread and the wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And the sacrificial death of Christ is reenacted on the altar and makes merits for the souls of mankind. So you see salvation through Christ's blood, uh, both on the cross and uh, in the uh, reenactment uh, of the altar. You see the chalice and uh, either a host or a patent next to it. And here's quoting from um, Hildegard. Uh, and of course, she's, she, here it's, uh, she's speaking as though it's Christ. Uh, as I, Christ, gave my blood on the cross for the freeing of the human race, so I hand it over now on the altar for humans. So you can see why uh, Bernard of Clairvaux thought that this was uh, truly a vision, that that is, that is uh, definitely uh, orthodox thinking right there. Now, you can see these little roundels, and they're sometimes actually called mirrors because uh, mirrors would have been round, uh, with just little abbreviated scenes uh, from different Bible stories. Um, on the column on our, our left, Christ's right, at the bottom, we sort of start there, uh, we can see Mary and the Christ child in a manger. So this refers to the first sacrifice of Christ, the incarnation, because it was a huge sacrifice for God to become human. Uh, then up above, we see an entombment, which refers to the death of Christ and the saving sacrifice, uh, what would happen uh, after the crucifixion. Um, and you'll notice that Christ is being laid out uh, in a tomb, it, it, sort of a, in a similar fashion that he's laid in the manger. So there's this, this parallel of altar, uh, looks a lot like the manger, which looks something like uh, the, um, the tomb. Uh, then on the other side, we see Christ coming out of the tomb. He's holding a cross, uh, and that's on the bottom, you know, on our right. And then above, uh, Christ striding upward uh, as he ascends into heaven. Now, one of the other things I should have pointed out, you probably noticed, that unlike the Uta Gospels, this is a Christ suffering. Um, his eyes are closed, his head tips to one side, uh, he's wearing a, a loincloth rather than the complete garment, in this case uh, it's a modest loincloth, almost like a skirt, um, and he hangs down a little bit from the, from the cross. Uh, there's also this delineation of his ribs and his pectoral muscles, you know, add to this feeling of strain. And this is a very strange image. <laughs> Um, according to her vision, the red head symbolizes the zeal of God for justice. 
Um, and you can see it's found where these two masonry walls come together. Now, Hildegard does seem to use a lot of architectural motifs, uh, both in her vision and in the uh, illuminations of the manuscripts. And of course, one of the suggestions was that sometimes this is part of vision, uh, excuse me, sometimes this is part of a uh, migraine, certain kinds of migraine, he migraine headaches when you see what look like architectural shapes or crenellations. Uh, however, remember, Hildegard is involved in building uh, the Rupertsburg Monastery, and uh, she would probably have been involved in uh, uh, picking designs and uh, making sure that uh, the, the materials were delivered to the builders and just you know, overseeing things. So that would have probably been on her mind. Uh, and uh, so architectural motifs might you know, work very well just with what's going on. Um, and then, of course, there is just the idea that goes back, certainly at least to St. Augustine, of the idea of the celestial city, um, the city of God, New Jerusalem in heaven, all of these concepts. Uh, so these are supposed to be the walls of a celestial city, and once, uh, one wall is smooth, which represents uh, contemplative knowledge. And the other is the masonry wall, or the works, or the acts of mankind. So you have um, active and contemplative works and faith. If you want to, uh, it doesn't it doesn't play out like that in her in her vision? Adding later interpretations there, perhaps. Um, we also see a rather interesting uh, image of the devil being uh, conquered. Uh, and the shape is so unusual. I mean, where do you ever see a sort of backwards L as a composition? Uh, and yet, when they wrote this out, they left that space. So it had already been decided that this was how they would have it. Um, you have this black and hairy devil uh, who is uh, chained, and uh, Hildegard says there's poisoned arrows coming from his mouth. Uh, she talks about a burning light on the mountain, and you can see these stylized flames, where a multitude of people, these would be the faithful, the virtuous people, uh, they trample on the devil, and they're protected from his poison and his evil uh, by the crystal curtain of God's law. And so we have this somewhat uh, uh, way of a sort of transparent wall. One of the things, of course, is the devil is lying down horizontally as he's bound and trampled under, and then you have that idea of verticality for the virtuous people. Uh, remember, we often do use that. We say they're good and upright. Uh, verticality, uh, often we, we think of looking up to God. Uh, I will raise my eyes to the hills. And, of course, uh, Gothic churches are just uh, coming into being at the time of this, uh, but we often do think of that as... Uh, the verticality of that type of architecture is, is reflecting this idea of, of uh, going to heaven as a kind of spiritual idea. This is you know, right from her vision. The virtues are building the house of wisdom. God, Christ here, is commanding the labor. Uh, she says the wheel represents God's compassion. Now, when you say the virtues, I would assume that you would have you know, either the uh, three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Or, since perhaps the four cardinal virtues, uh, justice, fortitude, temperance, prudence, but they aren't. They're identified. So you have constancy, who's in the center, and you can see this as, I said, a heart, a, a, a stag, a, a deer with antlers, is on her chest. Um, this is a reference, um, very uh, reference that's used very often in Christian iconography, uh, that the heart thirsts. Uh, for the living waters. And so this uh, you know, is a representation of, symbolically, of the faithful Christians uh, who partake of uh, the living waters of uh, Christ and his doctrine. Um, heavenly desire, compunction of heart, and down in the lower right you see a figure that doesn't have any features on the face. That's not just abrasion. Uh, this is uh, supposed to be uh, Peace, harmony and peace whose face is so bright it could not be looked on. So it's so bright that we can't see the features. And then in the circle is a figure which she identifies as contempt for the world. Uh, you know, interest in spiritual matters rather than earthly. 
and these together will build a house of wisdom. There is one other book of Hildegard's writings that was illustrated in the 12th century, and that is the Liber Diviorum Opera, the Book of Divine Works. Now, they don't think that this was illustrated at the time that Hildegard was still alive. They think that it was um, illustrated after her death. And one of the suggestions is that it was in connection of one of the times when uh, she was uh, nominated for sainthood. Uh, there were uh, several times that she was put up for canonization. In fact, she's often called Saint Hildegard of Bingham, although she was never formally can canonized. Um, however, it has been suggested that elements of the illustrations might be from Hildegard's designs uh, and being reused, and of course uh, certain other things are, would be appearing there. Um, she has another cosmology here, more conventional in the sense that it's not egg shape, it is the uh, circular shape of the universe, or the, um, but you see uh, uh, the cultivation of the earth and the different seasons of the years. Uh, and then down in the corner there's Hildegard. Uh, writing her vision. So it's like she's seeing the vision and writing it. Um, that's fairly familiar. You have pictures uh, throughout the Middle Ages of, for example, uh, St. John the Evangelist, uh, and then the scenes of the apocalypse are up above, the small figure. Uh, but you can see how that would fit well into a canonization because it's like, you know, our candidate for sainthood, our saint, is really seeing these things. She's really receiving um, these visions from God. And there you can see her in, in the manuscript doing this. Um, she talks about on human nature, and um, as you notice here, we have a human figure in the center of uh, the sphere of the universe, and around it is this sort of red being, uh, seems to have two heads, uh, which is supposed to represent God. Uh, and uh, sort of in the, in the center of God uh, is the universe, and God contains all of the universe. Um, there are uh, images of uh, the winds blowing here. Uh, if you look at the side, uh, you might not be able to see them very well, but there's little uh, lines coming out, and these are the winds are blowing. Uh, the firmament is set in motion, and that affects the hu humors of the human body. So there's relationship between the universe and, uh, and uh, mere human beings. So that idea of uh, man as a microcosm, in a sense. And I couldn't help but do this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you notice that the image from um, Hildegard of Bingham's uh, um, Book of Divine Works uh, has uh, the nude figure, nude male figure, with his arms outstretched. That's from the 12th century. And here you can see uh, the Vitruvian man uh, of Leonardo da Vinci with the same kind of idea here that the, the human being um, is a kind of microcosm of the world. That the sphere, or here the circle and the square, uh, that mankind can uh, fill these, can encompass them. So um, sort of a, a, a visual descendant, although I'm sure Leonardo never saw Hildegard's manuscript. 